Boldwood presents Shameful Secrets on Coronation Close, written by Lizzie Lane and read by Anne Dover. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 January 1937 Thelma Dawson dashed from room to room of the house she shared with her daughters at number 12, Coronation Close, a cul-de-sac of red-brick council houses on the Knoll West estate to the south of the city of Bristol. Her daughters, Mary and Alice, trotted along behind her with indignant expressions and frequent exclamations. Ma, are you going to be late for work? We can make sure everything's ready for our George. I can't help it. I so want everything to be perfect. My boy is coming home. I can barely believe it. For the third, or maybe even the fourth time, she flicked a duster at the spotlessly clean top of the pine chest of drawers. The item of furniture was newly acquired, sourced for her by neighbour and friend Jenny Crawford. Jenny in turn had found it at Robin Hubert's second-hand furniture shop in Philwood Broadway. Robin was sweet on Jenny, so she'd got it for a bargain price. Thelma had made new curtains, laundered the bedding, and bought a brand new eider down from a shop in East Street, Bedminster, where a variety of shops nestled close to the dominating presence of the W.D. and H.O. Wills tobacco factory. It wasn't often she could afford new, but it was for her boy, her eldest child, and she deemed him worth it. George was the only one of her children to be born in wedlock, his father having died during the Great War. The fathers of her two daughters had passed like ships in the night, though she'd hoped for more at the time. In the past, she'd fallen for men who had excited her made her feel alive. Her current man-friend, Cuthbert Throgmorton, Bert as she called him, wasn't exciting. He was safe and almost predictable, and in a way she loved him. Even so, she couldn't see marriage ever being on the cards, certainly not whilst his mother was still around. Still, Thelma lived in hope. She continued to fizz with excitement. I want it all nice, comfortable and clean for when our George comes. Mary exchanged a long-suffering glance with Alice, who promptly snatched the duster from her mother's hands and tucked it behind her back when she attempted to snatch it back. Ma, you could eat your pork chop off the floor in here, Mary piped up. In the absence of the duster, Thelma flicked at things with her bare hand. Finally, she stood in the doorway and surveyed the small but neat box room that her son, coming home from the sea and his profession as a merchant seaman, would presently occupy. Excitement at the prospect made her anxious. Does it really look good? I mean everything. The curtains, the wallpaper, the furniture. The two sisters, totally unlike each other in colouring on account of having different fathers, exchanged a long-suffering look, shrugging their narrow shoulders and shaking their heads. Alice breathed an exasperated sigh. Oh, everything's lovely, Mum. There ain't any dust. Me and Alice checked, and so did you, about a dozen times. The two of them were used to cleaning and cooking. Thelma worked full-time at Bertram's, an upmarket ladies' dress shop, doing a job that she loved little girls they might be, Mary eleven, Alice ten, but they liked taking responsibility for domestic chores. Other girls only played at being a housewife. Mary and Alice did it for real. Thelma resisted any more fussing, but it was hard. I want everything perfect for my boy. Her eyes glistened at the thought of him coming home. Only a few days now. He'd been away for almost a year, one in which so many changes had occurred. The country had lost a king and gained another, and her new friend, Jenny Crawford, had moved into number two coronation close, next door to Mrs. Partridge at number one. 
Her other friend, Kath Lockhart, lived at the far end of the cul-de-sac at number eight. Her house was number twelve, from where she could glare across with undisguised dislike at Dorothy Partridge, immediately opposite at number one. Overall, they were a diverse lot. Some of her neighbours kept chickens. One of them kept goats, who were sustained by kitchen scraps donated by anyone who had some to give. It saved bothering to put it in the pig bin, the small receptacle the council provided. The residents of the council houses of Coronation Close were a good bunch, apart from Mrs. Partridge at number one, the house right opposite her own at number twelve. That's the way the numbers were in a cul-de-sac. She had to admit that Dorothy's sister Harriet seemed all right, but Dorothy Partridge herself was a troublemaker, the sort who wrote to the council if any of her neighbours put a foot wrong. Thelma was a frequent subject of her letters. So far, Dorothy had failed to bring Thelma down, but she kept trying. She couldn't seem to help herself. If the mantel clock downstairs hadn't struck the hour, Thelma might have found another duster or got the carpet sweeper back out and pursued perfection for a bit longer. Oh, my God, look at that time. Why didn't you tell me? We did tell you. The three of them, mother and daughters, thudded off down the stairs. Unlike most of her neighbours, Thelma made a point of looking smart no matter what time of day. Most of her clothes were handmade, cut down from decent quality second-hand stuff she bought from Saturday afternoon jumble sales. Never would she dream of leaving the house without lipstick, face powder or mascara. Never did she slop around in an old cardigan and slippers, hair in curlers like her friend Kath. The overmantel mirror proclaimed that her hair was perfect, her lipstick unsmeared, and her eyelashes were suitably slick with mascara, while the face powder gave her face a peachy glow. She was bubbling with excitement. George was coming home. It had been almost a year since she'd last seen him, and although she loved her daughters to distraction, George was her firstborn, her only son, and the apple of her eye. In the meantime, her job at Bertram's Modes awaited her. Work, she murmured, grabbing her handbag and checking its contents. We must get to work. She shouted out to the kitchen where her daughters were now preparing fried bread and tea for herself and for them. Here you are, Ma, said Alice. She almost tripped over the hem of the adult-size apron she was wearing as she handed her mother a slice of fried bread and a cup of tea. It's cold out there. I reckon it's going to snow. If not today, then very soon. You need something inside you, she pronounced, in a manner belying her years. Eat your fried bread. What would I do without you two, she said, as she bit into the bread. You'd be late for work all the time, said Mary, in her matter-of-fact manner. Get that down you and get going. You ain't got all day, added Alice. Thelma resisted rolling her eyes and laughing. Sometimes it seemed as though they were mothering her, not the other way round. Right, I'm off. Goodbyes were said, and then her heels were clattering up the garden path. She bent her head into the bitter wind. The sky was grey, and people standing at the bus stop were hunkered into their mufflers, slapping their gloved hands together to keep out the cold. The bus was on time, but Thelma's mind was so preoccupied imagining the homecoming that she almost forgot to get off at her stop. Excuse me, excuse me. After squeezing down the aisle between the seats, she made the rear platform of the bus and jumped off just as it began to move off. Her leap was slightly mistimed. She staggered between curb and pavement. Her fall was impeded by a steady pair of hands. Steady on, love. She thanked whoever it was. The strong hands continued to grip as she mounted the pavement. Thank you, she said again. I can manage now. Do I get a kiss? She slapped him away. Cheeky bugger. No, you don't. Let me go while you be late for work. Once the grip was relinquished, she hurried off for Bertram's, 
the dress shop where she'd risen from general sales assistant to leading sales assistant in a very short time. Right from the start they'd recognised she had a flair for fashion, dressed well, and flattered dithering customers into making a purchase. She had the gift of the gab, and it went a long way to persuading people to buy what they didn't think they needed. Thelma tottered along on black suede court shoes. She'd never been late for work yet, but today she might be, and Mr. Bertram hated lateness. A shilling was docked from wages for each five minutes late. A shilling was a lot. She could buy a pair of stockings with that, or two pounds of tea. Serves me right for being distracted, she said to herself. By the skin of her teeth, she made it outside the heavy mahogany doors of the shop, grabbed one of the pair of brass handles, and pushed it open. The smell of the interior of Bertram's modes never failed to excite her. Silks, satins, wool, cotton, and linen all had a smell of their own, and she loved every one of them. She also loved the smell of kid gloves that Bertram sold in several colours, though black, tan, or cream were the best sellers. Women were Bertram's lifeblood, and as such the place also smelled of them. Face powder and the lingering hint of expensive perfumes mixed with that of the sumptuous materials. Providing a firm and solid background to those smells was the beeswax polish used on the honey-coloured wooden walls, the counters, and the chestnut-brown lino. Stiff, unseeing mannequins posed on round, raised plinths, their fingers long and cold. Cashmere dresses, only affordable to wealthy women, clung to narrow hips on some, whilst others wore smart jackets with padded shoulders, pleated skirts, hats with broad brims, small brims, feathers and veils. Each morning Thelma acknowledged them as though they were human. Good morning, girls. They never answered, of course. They were made of plaster, painted and posed to look lifelike. Thelma loved this place loved her work, and had learned to tolerate those customers who considered that working girls should be slavish rather than of service. Normally, she was the height of efficiency and good at holding back what she really wanted to say, but today she couldn't concentrate as well as she usually did. It would have suited her if there were no customers today, suited her too if she could have directed them to a work colleague, but the fact was, some customers asked for her by name. I said I wanted cream-coloured gloves, said the aloof and elegantly dressed woman she was currently serving. Quite tall, and of course very elegant, as most of their customers were, she wore a fur coat that looked like mink. The shoulders were square, and the coat was knee-length. A net veil trimmed the dark red hat she wore. A pair of overly long feathers sprouted like a peacock tail at one side. Oh, I'm so sorry, madam, Thelma was distracted. So you should be. Are you new here? Thelma resisted snatching the gloves back. The truth was, she just didn't have her usual patience this morning. This evening and George were everything. No, madam. Have you a supervisor, a senior sales assistant, who knows what they're doing? The tone was imperious. The plucked eyebrows arched and the deep-set eyes viewed her with contempt. I am a senior sales assistant, madam, returned Thelma, smiling through gritted teeth. She wanted to slap the woman across her heavily rouged cheek. Both cheeks, in fact. But her wages were made up with commission. Though it was far from easy. She forced herself to be polite. These are the only cream gloves we have, she said, bringing out a pair from the drawer and setting them out on the counter. To Thelma's surprise, the woman scrunched one up into a ball in her fist. Hmm, it doesn't feel very soft. Are you sure this is really a kid glove? I won't wear ordinary leather, much too coarse. I have very soft and sensitive skin, you see. Thelma glanced at the clock ticking away the minutes and hours on the wall, the time slowly passing before George arrived. 
Nothing was as important in her life as her children. It made her want to shout and scream at this woman, but awkward customers were nothing new. Instead, she decided to lie. You're quite right, madam. They're not kid at all. They're chamois, and much more expensive than kid gloves. In fact, I think they're the last pair we have, and goodness knows when we'll get any more. They're rare, you see, quite rare and expensive. Though these are slightly cheaper, seeing as they're the last pair that we have, but still too expensive for most of our customers. The woman's red lips parted, and Thelma was sure she heard an intake of breath. The covetous look on her face was evidence enough that she was going to buy them. No matter how much they were, she had to have them, if only to prove that she had the money to do so, and to stop anyone else having them. Wrap them up. She gathered her crocodile handbag from off the counter and ordered that the price of the gloves should be put onto her account. My name's Mrs. Justin Cooper. My husband is the judge, the Honourable Mr. Justin Cooper. Thelma nodded politely, as though her name and status were familiar to her. I've put them in a decent-sized bag. Such gloves should be carried in splendour, said Thelma with a forced smile that didn't reach her eyes. Not that this particular customer would notice that. Mrs. Justin Cooper swept out past Miss Apsley, the supervisor, who mainly oversaw the millinery department and had been partially responsible for taking Thelma on. Miss Apsley reached for one of the brass door handles, a ready and slightly subservient smile on her face. Let me get the door for you, madam. With slow deliberation, the door closed softly once Mrs. Justin Cooper had sailed through it. Mrs. Justin Cooper, Thelma whispered into Miss Apsley's ear. Her husband's a judge. What did you sell her? she asked, her hands clasped in front of her. A pair of cream kid gloves. The pair that's been hanging around in the drawer ever since I started here. Really? Now it was Miss Apsley's eyebrows that rose. I hope you told her that they're the last pair. I did, in a manner of speaking. I just tweaked the description a bit. Miss Apsley pulled in her chin, a question in her eyes. Don't worry, said Thelma, already looking to serve the next customer, who was presently dipping over the glass-topped counter, eyes on the drawer containing cami knickers. She thinks she's got a bargain. A pair of chamois gloves as opposed to common kid. Chamois is kid. That's what I thought. So I wasn't lying. I just elaborated a bit. After all, they're both goats, aren't they? Miss Apsley smiled and her eyes sparkled. Very commendable, Mrs. Dawson. Very commendable indeed. Chapter Two Kath Lockhart's metal curlers jingled like sleigh bells as she hurried along at Jenny's side, head bent against the cold easterly wind. They were both on their way to Stan Harding, the butcher, in Philwood Broadway. All the way there, Kath had been expressing her annoyance that Thelma had invited Bert Throgmorton to her son's celebratory homecoming. Never invited me, though. We thought she would have. I do like a party. Everyone does, said Jenny. But this is a coming home party for her son. It's a family thing. I suspect she wants him to herself for a while. Kath wasn't impressed. Her lips were tightly pursed. Bert Throgmorton ain't family. He's the rent man. You know as well as I do that Bert and Thelma are close. You could almost call them engaged. Engaged? Kath sounded dumbfounded. Even her curlers jangled with indignation as she shook her head violently. It was enough to dislodge one that had been dangling on her forehead and send it with a pinging sound onto the pavement. She stopped to pick it up. She ain't never said anything to me about them being engaged and I'm her best friend. Unless you know different. She sniffed and tightened the knot on her headscarf. 
Kath's tone was resentful, and the insinuating barb easy to understand. She'd been Thelma's closest friend until Jenny had moved into number two. Kath lived at the far end of the close. Jenny was under no doubt that she would prefer to be closer to Thelma so she could better see what was going on and be even more inextricably linked in her life than she presently was. The closer they lived, the easier it was for Kath to pop in and out at will. As it was, being at the end of the close, she missed things and did resent that newcomer Jenny lived closer. All I know, said Jenny, determined to be as friendly with Kath as she was with Thelma and not to come between them, is that he won't leave his mother, so marriage is out of the question for now. Unless she kicks the bucket, Kath said in a resolute manner. She shook her head, yet again sending her curlers rattling. I don't think he'll marry her even then, do you? I've no idea. Jenny clenched the handles of her shopping bags, glad of her gloves in the bitter weather. Kath was nice enough, but possessive, jealously guarding her friendship with Thelma. During the week and Saturday morning when Thelma was at work, she popped in to see Jenny. When Thelma was home, it was a different matter, and Jenny saw nothing of Kath. Not that Jenny minded being second best. She understood that the friendship between the two other women had existed before she'd arrived, and felt awkward at times, though not regretful. The fact was she'd got on with Thelma from the very first. She had the energy of ten women, was as brave as a lion, and her exuberance was infectious. Coronation Close was a far cry from the grim rooms of Blue Bowl Alley in the city centre, and Thelma was a breath of fresh air, just like the close itself. Kath's old fur boots looked two sizes too big for her feet. The tops of a pair of thick men's socks covered half the space between her feet and her shins. The astrakhan fur of her collar was pulled tightly up around her face, and she was speaking through the knot of her headscarf. Seeing as it was winter, the headscarf that covered her curlers was of thick woolen check. In summer, it was mostly cotton, or what she called silk, but was obviously not. Nobody in coronation clothes could afford silk, not real silk. They skirted two mothers chatting over the tops of prams and headed for the butchers, where skeins of sawdust formed a lacy pattern over the floor of black and white tiles in front of the door. Heard anything from your old man? Kath asked. He's in Palestine, Jenny answered, and tried not to sound casual about it. She wasn't sure whether that was where Roy had ended up, but knew he was abroad. The slip that accompanied the money the army sent to her said so. It did not disclose a specific location. As long as she received her housekeeping, it didn't really matter. Is he up there? I believe so. She really did not want to talk about it. Is he close to the sea? Nice if he is. He can cool off when he gets too hot. Jenny couldn't help the smile that came to her lips. Kath wasn't so much gullible as lacking in education. She didn't read and signed her name laboriously, taking trouble with each letter. Jenny thought carefully before replying to the simple question. I think he's stationed in Jerusalem. Policing operations, so I understand. She was only guessing, but had read as such in the newspapers. Will he get any leave? Not yet. She couldn't help being curt. Roy was far away, and she didn't want to think about him. He would not be home for a long time. He had joined the army because he'd been as unhappy with their marriage as she had been. Being in uniform and in the company of other men suited him far better. The only times he'd promised to come home was to see his daughters. She had hoped he might have been home for this last Christmas, but he hadn't. Not that she wanted to see him. It was all about saving face, appearing totally normal for her daughters. Being seen to come home would also silence any wagging tongues 
or any rumours that he might not be just an ordinary married man. The fact that he preferred the company of men was neither here nor there. Freedom had come at a price, but she was fine that he wasn't there. They were happier apart than together. As usual, there was a queue at the butcher's on account of the meat being a bit cheaper than the co-op in Melvin Square. Stan knew his customers didn't have much money and gave away bits and pieces they could make use of. A marrow bone to make a good stew, or a couple of squashed sausages found their way into the shopping bag of someone on their uppers. Jenny and Kath were next to be served. Jenny stayed upright. Kath bent low, squinting at the pile of pigs' tails, lambs' hearts and pigs' livers. Offal and bony bits were always cheaper than everything else, and were presented in huge trays on the counter. Bones anyone could have for free were at one end. Jenny had her eyes on a breast of lamb. After taking the bones out and cutting off most of the fat, she intended rolling it around a stuffing of breadcrumbs, onions and sage. The sage and mint she'd planted in the back garden had run riot. The onions hadn't done quite so well, but there was still enough to make stuffing for the breast of lamb. Cheeks as red and glossy as ripe apples, Stan turned his attention to Jenny and Kath. Right, me loves, what can I do for you two beauties? Two pound of your best steak, but only if it doesn't cost me any more than half a crown. Stan's belly, round as a beer barrel, wobbled in time with his laughter. <laughs> My, but you're a cheeky one. Dimples dented Jenny's cheeks as she shared his amusement. I suppose that's a no. In the past, she'd never have dared banter with any male shopkeeper. Number one, she'd never had the time. Roy had insisted she only strayed outside their old home in Blue Bowl Alley if it was strictly necessary, and then no fraternising with anyone, especially the opposite sex. Occasionally, she chanced her luck and tasted freedom, knowing full well that if she were found out, there'd be hell to pay. Thanks to Roy's overbearing manner, she just never had the confidence to make idle talk with another man. Things had changed a great deal since moving to Coronation Close and him joining the army. I'm off to the greengrocers, she said to Kath, once her order for pork cuttings and a breast of lamb were wrapped and inside her shopping bag. Kath said she'd catch up with her later. She shielded her mouth and whispered as though it were a huge secret. I'm off to Melvin Square. I need to call in at the chemist. Woman's things, thought Jenny, smiling as she headed across the broad expanse of grass to the greengrocers on the other side of the Broadway. Anything to do with procreation or feminine bodily functions was spoken about in a low whisper. It included sex, sanitary towels and contraceptive sheaths. Even pregnancy. None of these very personal things were ever mentioned in front of a man. Needing to go to the greengrocer meant she had to pass her old friend Robin Hubert's second-hand furniture shop. She hadn't meant to look in to say hello, hadn't meant to even look in the window. As it happened, she didn't need to. There he was, standing in the doorway, propped up at shoulder height with one shirt-sleeved arm and smoking a cigarette. The sight of his bare arm in this cold made her shiver. Aren't you cold? she asked him. Mrs. Crawford, I always warm up when I see you. Mr. Hubert, you're too saucy for your own good. She suppressed a smile, telling herself that she shouldn't encourage him. Still, Robin had always been incorrigible to the extent of being downright cheeky. Not so much of late, though, not since he'd split up with his wife. Sadness had depressed his natural exuberance. Sporting the vestige of a smile, he flicked his finished cigarette into a clump of weeds growing around a drain. Out shopping, then? I am. She held up her shopping bag. How's business? He nodded once, twice, three, then four times, as though mentally accounting every recent transaction. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. I see you offer instalments. 
She nodded at the sign that had been stuck in the window from when he'd first opened. He folded his arms and grimaced. You know me, a sucker for a sob story. Too soft for me own good. Most of them pain on tick pay me a few bob when they can. But some do a runner. Oh well, that's life. She shook her head and smiled. As long as you're still earning a living. I am, he said, somewhat more brightly. I'd hang on to more of it if Doreen didn't come telling me she can't manage. She'd have the shirt off me back if she could. Bloody cow, he muttered, flinging the finished cigarette into the road. Jenny eyed the range of items displayed in the window. A hall stand, a bamboo table, and a standard lamp jostled for space beside a second standard lamp with a tasseled shade. How about your lad that was helping? Is he still around? No, he lives in Brigstock Road. It was a bit too far. Old Fred Fuller comes in to give me a hand when I need to deliver furniture or move things about. He can drive too. Drove a tank back in the Great War. That's good. He sounds capable. Robin shook his head and laughed. <laughs> he is for the most part, though I'm not so sure about his driving. I keep reminding him that it's a van, not a bloody tank, and we're delivering furniture, not shooting at Germans. Their laughter invoked the warmth of a shared past, a time when they'd been close, before Roy had entered her life and Doreen had entered his. They'd been so much younger then. Once their laughter had died, an awkward silence descended as thoughts returned to the past. Robin gazed across the green expanse in the middle of the Broadway. Jenny continued to scrutinise the items on show in the window. As she gazed, mostly unseeing of real detail, she found herself wondering how things would have been if she hadn't fallen for Roy if she and Robin's close friendship had continued. Do you remember when we went up the Downs that day in June when we were about ten years old? We took a couple of jam sandwiches and a bottle of ginger ale. His recalling of a long-ago day in a distant summer jerked her from where she'd been. Yes, it was sunny. Well, it was for most of the time. All summers are sunny when you're young. You're right. Every day seemed to be sunny back then, even when it wasn't summertime. She could have added that it vanished when she'd fallen for Roy, the cloud that had taken the sunshine. I hear your old man's joined the army. Immediately feeling uncomfortable, she started, stuttered a little. Oh, who told you? Robin shrugged. Oh, I don't recall. You know how it is. Word gets around. What word? she wondered. Was anyone privy to the true reason for Roy joining the army? For the rift in their marriage? The look he gave her was difficult to interpret, but she sensed longing more than curiosity. I'd better be going. She began to step away. If you ever want to pop in and have a chat, I'm always here. If you fancy, that is. She smiled. I bear it in mind then rushed away. Thelma would remain her sounding board, though for the most part, Jenny preferred to keep things to herself. It felt as though her face was on fire when she left the Broadway. Although Kath must be somewhere ahead of her by now, Jenny made the sudden decision to follow her to Melvin Square. It would at least cool her face. There was nothing she wanted at the chemist, but knew instinctively that Kath would be lingering in there waiting until there were no other customers so she could ask for what she wanted without anyone overhearing. Necessities, she thought, but we keep them a secret. Just as she'd guessed, Kath had waited until the shop was empty of customers. Jenny got there just in time to hear her ask for very strong laxatives. Penny Royal? And anything else good for getting things moving, if you know what I mean? Jenny realised Kath hadn't heard her come in, or her voice would have been quieter, or she wouldn't have asked for what she'd asked for at all. She'd assumed Kath merely wanted sanitary products. This was more serious. Kath only looked slightly surprised when she turned round and saw her. 
The chemist, however, who'd firstly looked at Kath without batting an eyelid, suddenly seemed nervous, deep hollows appearing beneath sharp cheekbones, a slight cough, and then, I'm sure I don't know what you mean. Jenny gave the chemist a knowing look. We both know that you do. Don't worry. We're friends and neighbours. A trouble shared. Kath had an open face. If she felt any guilt at what she was asking for, it didn't show in her expression. Jenny knew very well the reason she was asking for strong laxatives. Sometimes, taken along with strong liquor such as gin or whiskey, it was a well-known method of ending an unwanted pregnancy. Jenny patted her neighbour's arm. You all right, Kath? The shape of Kath's lips was something between a smile and a wince. She shrugged nonchalantly. Well, you know how it is, my little problem, but no need to worry. There's ways and means, ain't there? A look of feminine understanding flashed from one woman to the other. Jenny didn't need Kath to spell out what it was she needed to get moving. Kath, mother of six, was expecting again, and it was one mouth too many. Fancy a cuppa when we get back to the close? Jenny asked her. Love too. Got any biscuits? I think so. Bloody cold today, said Kath, shrugging her shoulders and blowing between pinched lips. Could do with a cuppa, unless you got some cuckoo, that is. I have. So it was that they hurried back to Coronation Close, up the path to number two, and shut the door firmly behind them. Kath's coat and scarf stayed in place. She made herself comfortable. Jenny poked the fire before taking her coat off. A few spindly flames flickered, then turned to a glow. It wasn't often Kath came into Jenny's house for a cuppa without Thelma being there. This was one occasion when Jenny felt obliged to have her in for a little chat. Cocoa was made, ideal for a cold day like today, although Jenny was careful to make it from one half milk to one half water. After dunking a biscuit, then taking a sip, Kath was into her stride. Once I reached forty, we thought that was it. No more babies. No more the other either, she added a pale pink flush colouring her cheeks. I don't know where my Bill gets his energy from. Really, I don't. There was a sparkle in her eyes, and her blush deepened before being partially hidden behind her teacup. Some women would love such attention, Jenny remarked. She was curious to know whether Kath wore her curlers to bed, but thought it unlikely the whole point being that she only wore them during the day, so her hair was a mass of bouncing waves by the time Bill came home. Thelma had told her that once the clock struck six, she let down her hair and changed into a fresh dress and pinny. The thought made her smile. Lovely Coco, said Kath. Jenny thought about the contents of the plain brown paper bag. Would you... Like a glass of water now, to wash the pills down. Kath looked a bit vacant at first before coming to a decision. No thanks, I can wash it down with this cocoa. Out came the bottle, off came the top. To Jenny's surprise, she tipped two, then three of the round black pills into her hand. Isn't one enough? Two, at the most. Kath shook her head and tipped all three into her mouth. After a swig of cocoa and a swallow, she managed to say, I've always found three work best. You've taken them before? She nodded. A couple of times. A couple meant quite a few, Jenny decided, and it struck her that Kath was purposely vague when it suited her. It came as no great surprise when she changed the subject. I wonder how much George has changed after being all over the world like he has. Been away from home do change blokes, don't it? Changed my bill, even though he was only in the medical corps. Conscientious objector, you see. Didn't hold with marching off to war in a foreign country. Right, too. She shook her head dolefully. 
All them young men, dead and buried, miles from home. Don't seem fair, do it? Jenny agreed with her that it certainly didn't seem fair. Her own husband had only served in the last year of the war, but even so it had affected him. Not so much in a physical sense, but in the sense that he'd believed things would be better once peace had been won. The sad fact was that it hadn't been better, and he'd grown bitter about it. I never met George. He was already at sea by the time I arrived. Lovely chap he is. A dead spit for his old man, from what Thelma said. Mind you, we've never seen a photo of his dad. Thelma reckons she does have a photo somewhere. Kath took a noisy glug of tea. I oh, can't blame him going to sea. Young chaps like a bit of adventure in their lives before they settle down. I suppose so, said Jenny. She felt Kath eyeing her quizzically. Her guess was that she was leading up to asking questions about Roy. Why had he joined up? Wasn't he a bit old for that? After all, he was not a young bachelor, but married with a family. Every so often, someone asked her how he was. Had she heard from him when he was likely to come home on leave? She answered cagily. George, a young man, was one thing. Going off on an adventure at Roy's time of life was bound to have aroused curiosity. As agreed with Roy, the truth of his going would remain a shared secret. Goodness, look at the time. It's getting on for four o'clock. I'd better think about getting the girls' tea ready. Jenny took Kath's empty cup and saucer, piling it on top of her own with an air of finality and hoping that Kath wouldn't notice that it was not long after three-thirty. Kath followed her out to the kitchen. Jenny sensed she had more to say. She only hoped it didn't include questions about Roy. Kath picked up the tea towel as Jenny began rinsing the cups beneath the tap. I was wondering whether Thelma might invite us over once George has got comfortable. I've no idea. Jenny passed her a cup. She ain't invited you, then? She sounded surprised. No. Why should she? Kath shook her way in a so-so manner. I just wondered. The first cup wiped. Kath ignored the second and poked at the curlers that bundled onto her forehead. I'd better go on home and smart myself up, just in case she does think of inviting me. I do like a party. So you said. But there, Bill must love to see you with your hair down. He does. Even after all these years, he still tells me I'm the best-looking girl he ever went out with. Gaps showed in her teeth when she smiled. Her cheekbones were high, and although her complexion was sallow, her appearance hinted at the lovely-looking girl she'd once been. Thinking of Kath and Bill in a clinch brought the visit of the chemist to Jenny's mind. Will you be taking any more of those laxatives tonight? Hmm. I might do. Depends how I feel. Depends on if we've got any gin in the house either. Might have whiskey. Bill likes whiskey, but ain't so keen on gin. Might have a hot bath, too. I usually take a bath on a Saturday night, but I might have one tonight, just to get things moving, if you know what I mean. As long as Bill lights the boiler for me. Yes. Laxatives, gin, and a nice hot bath. Three quarters of an hour later, Jenny's daughters, Tilly and Gloria, who were more or less the same age as Thelma's daughters, came in as ravenous as ever, faces pink with cold. Once their coats were off, they swiftly devoured the bread and jam she'd put out, a necessary filler before their main evening meal. It's going to snow, said Tilly. No, it isn't, Gloria retorted. I felt the first flakes when we came out of school. Gloria ignored her, and instead asked, What are we having tonight? Cold meat with bubble and squeak. We had that in sandwiches at dinner time. You had that at lunch time, Jenny corrected. The piece of brisket they'd had at the weekend had served them well. Stewed with onions and carrots and served with boiled potatoes, 
forced through the mincer to make shepherd's pie, and today the last slices to be eaten cold. Having enough for the sandwiches she'd given them at midday had been a bonus. School began at nine in the morning. Lunchtime was from twelve to one, and everyone took sandwiches. Some of the pupils brought in a single slice of bread and dripping for their midday meal. Those who had nothing were given a sandwich by kind-hearted teachers used to working in deprived areas, frequently bringing in and distributing whatever they could. The morning and afternoon breaks were spent playing in the schoolyard, running off the energy fed into them at breakfast, then at lunchtime. The school afternoon ended at four o'clock. No wonder they were always hungry. Did you know that Mary and Alice's brother is coming home today? Gloria piped up, whilst Tilly buried herself in a book. I did. They can't come out to play because they're putting on a spread. Do you think they'll invite us? They've got jelly and blancmange. And cake, said Tilly, without looking up from her book. Gloria continued with the details. Fruit cake and jam tarts. They made all of it themselves. It's a family affair, Jenny explained for the second time that day. Mrs. Dawson wants her son to herself. Gloria pouted. Oh, well, that's not fair. Tis to Mrs. Dawson. He's her son. She hasn't seen him for ages. After throwing a quick scowl in the direction of her sister, Tilly went back to her book, muttering, I told you so. Gloria asked if she could go out to play. Not for long, it's already dark, and if it gets much colder, we'll have snow, and wrap up. She's got a boyfriend, Tilly whispered. She's going out to meet him. She's too young. Tilly perched her head sideways. Am I too young? Yes. Wait until you leave school. That's two years' time. When I'm fourteen. Soon enough, Jenny said, suddenly feeling a great sadness land heavily on her shoulders. Two years wasn't that far away. Facing her girls growing up in such a short time was disconcerting. To her, they were still children and would be for some time. Deep in thought, she sliced the last of the cold meat from the bone, placed a plate over it, and proceeded to mix leftover vegetables into bubble and squeak. The big frying pan was already on the gas stove, a big lump of lard ready to melt once the gas was turned on. Being busy helped her blot out the obvious fact that her girls were not children any longer. One daughter out to play, and one reading, and both growing up fast. How different my daughters are, she thought, as she turned on the wireless. Picking up a sewing needle, Jenny prepared to do some mending. As she pushed the needle in and out, a variety of thoughts drifted through her mind, some less welcome than others. Her world had become a calm oasis since the end of last year, when Roy had signed up, though not without concern or incident. She ran through all the good things in her life. The rent was paid. Roy saw to that. Thanks also to him, she had enough money for food and clothes. Nothing extravagant or luxurious, but they were fed and dressed. Not everyone could say that. On top of that, she'd ended up living in a red brick council house with a garden front and rear. Such a contrast to the tumble-down tenement in Blue Bowl Alley. The rooms in the house they'd lived in there had dated from the Middle Ages, was in the centre of old Bristol, and had been shared with other families. Water had been drawn from an outside pump, and for them had been accessed down flights of winding stairs. In summer, the smell of the drains had wafted through the open windows. In winter, the cold was intense, the only form of heating provided by a small fire grate on which they'd done most of their cooking. Gaining a house in Coronation Close had seemed like heaven, providing her with everything she wanted, including friends and neighbours. Mrs. Partridge next door was the only fly in the ointment, a sour-faced, black-eyed woman who gave the impression of hating the whole world. Jenny had done her best to show friendliness, 
but her action had not been reciprocated. Thinking of Thelma, however, brought a smile to her face. She was so bold, so forthright, it seemed to her that nothing in the whole wide world could get her down. Then there was Kath, who made no secret of the fact that she and Bill were as in love as they were when they were young. But there are consequences, she thought to herself. For her sake, she hoped the pills Kath had taken would do what she wanted them to do. Still, at least she had Bill, and he loved her. Lucky her, she thought. At present, she was too busy to think about what she might be missing. There were times, though, when she wondered how long it might be until she felt lonely. But she put the thought from her mind. It wasn't as though she had far to look for someone who had kind thoughts of her. Robin was keen. She knew that, but was certain she didn't love him. Charlie Talbot, a shadowy figure in politics, did not hover so strongly in her dreams as he once had. She hadn't seen him for quite a time, and perhaps might never again. They were from different walks of life. She could tell that by his cut glass accent, the well-fed shine to his face, the good cut of his clothes. The sewing needle paused as she waded through what had been and what was. No matter, she thought. My life is full. I have my family, I have my friends, and if that wasn't enough, we have a street party and coronation to look forward to on May the 12th. After grim years of job shortages and hunger strikes, the coronation would go a long way to lifting everyone's spirits and give them hope for the future. The street party would give the residents of Coronation Close an excuse to forget their troubles, the unending routine of working to survive, and give them cause to celebrate. Thelma was taking charge of organising the party and had contacted everyone in the street to say so. Everyone had agreed she should run things, except for Mrs Partridge, who thought celebrating should be run by reputable authorities, people of standing who knew what they were doing. Thelma had reminded her that the people of standing didn't live in Coronation Close and were likely to only get involved with grander, more official events. Mrs. Partridge had slammed the door in her face. Unperturbed, Thelma had taken the reins regardless. Early days yet, but she was most definitely in charge for the residents of Coronation Close. Good old Thelma, Jenny thought to herself. Her energy was endless, her enthusiasm boundless. Never could Jenny ever imagine her being anything except courageous and loyal. No man would ever bend the redoubtable woman to his will, or squash her indomitable spirit. Nobody would dare. Chapter 3 Thelma thought she had the best job in the world, selling smart and expensive clothes to wealthy women. She'd never been one for leaving Bertram's on the stroke of six, but this evening was an exception. She almost raced out of the door, swiftly enough to make surprised-looking Philip Bertram comment to Mrs. Apsley. I've never known her rush off like that before. Have the bus times changed? Mrs. Apsley, who, despite her middle-class veneer and high standards, had taken a shine to Thelma, told him about Thelma's son George coming home on leave from the sea. She hasn't seen him for ages. I do hope she gets a bus home on time. They're sometimes so crowded at this time of night, and it's snowing. Mrs. Apsley was certainly right about that. The bus queue was long, and the weather was getting worse. Collars were turned up against the thickening snow, and feet were stamping to contend with the cold. Flurries of snow showed in the glow of amber streetlights, faster and faster, as the blizzard intensified. Lights in shop windows began to go out and darkness reigned supreme. Like everyone else, Thelma pulled her coat collar up around her face. Her breath steamed on the Arctic air. As if the icy pelting of snow wasn't enough to make her shiver, a draught blew up beneath her coat, a flared affair of pleats falling from padded shoulders. Fat flakes of wind-blown snow intensified from the size of gnats to that of bumblebees. A bus finally loomed out of the darkness, 
carefully lumbering forward through mist and maelstrom. Murmurs of appreciation replaced the grumbles of those waiting for it as they shuffled forward until becoming an ungainly rush of humanity struggling on board, glad to get out of the weather, even if many of them had to stand. The later bus she usually caught tended to be less crowded, and she always managed to get a seat. This earlier bus was jam-packed, but at least she got on, though found herself standing in the closely cramped space downstairs. She wrinkled her nose at the mix of humidity and unwashed bodies. Condensation misting the windows turned to trickles. The bus trundled away. Thick flakes hindered the headlamps, and the tyres were beginning to slither on the snow-covered roads. Won't we get there? she heard someone say. Then someone else. I need to get home. I can't walk. Not with my legs. Whatever their fears, the bus unhurriedly carried on, not at a great pace, but at a safe one. She guessed the journey would take longer than usual, but contented herself with the knowledge that George had been adamant that he'd be home by midday and before the snow had begun. Pools of darkness occurred where street lights had gone out. Along the flat main road that was St. John's Lane, lights from living room windows fought an ongoing battle against darkness and snowstorm. Coughs and sneezes inside the bus competed with the sound of crunching tyres and grinding gears. The bus lurched from side to side as it rounded the corner by the health clinic into Wedmore Vale. On their left, barely discernible now out of the misted windows, was Clancy's farm. Little could be seen of the farm buildings, the whole area a great pool of blackness. For now at least it remained farmland, though slowly being eroded, new houses creeping ever closer. As with St. John's Lane, Wedmore Vale presented a flat, even surface. Everything changed once they turned into Glyn Vale, a hill that became Donegal Road, both part of the long climb up to the council estate that had stolen the farmland that had once surrounded the city. Because of its increasing steepness, their progress slowed. Blimey! I could walk faster than this, somebody said. A few others echoed the sentiment. Grumbles erupted, but riding the bus was always preferable to walking. The hill became increasingly steep, and the outside air became colder, blowing onto the platform at the rear of the bus, helping to dispel the rancid air inside. The higher they climbed, the more intense the snow, a blizzard now, whirling around the bus and obliterating the houses on either side their progress became a snail's pace, even slower than before. Halfway up the very steepest part of the hill, the tyres at the rear of the bus lost their grip. The bus swayed. The rear began to slide from side to side on the cushion of ice and snow. Cries of alarm went up. Oh my God, we're all going to die! A man swore. A woman began reciting the Lord's Prayer. Bloody hell! Somebody else muttered. One woman screamed. Another made the comment that at least they weren't going downhill. Or we'd slide all the way down.